Good evening, everybody. This is Mike with On Point Preparedness. If you were celebrating Resurrection Day today, I hope it was a blessed one. If you celebrate it tomorrow, I likewise hope it is a blessed day for you all. And for this weekend, what I wanted to do is provide you with a teaching today on a very important infographic that a brother in Christ shared with me. And then tomorrow, just to give you a heads up, I'm going to do a live stream with Tony from a minute to midnight. And we're going to be really talking about everything that's going on in the news. That's going to be at around 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But again, today, this is mostly going to be focused on ministry. Uh, again, there's a brother in Christ. His name is Eric. I have his profile linked in the YouTube description box. He has a lot of infographics, a lot of things that he shares on his Facebook profile. That is his way that he does ministry most often. And one in particular really caught my eye, mostly because the body of Christ really needs to know and practice this. And it's something that I've been teaching on a lot over the past year or two. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pull this infographic up on the screen. And it's split in two. That's why I, I call this video the other side or the other half of Christianity. Because this infographic is split right down the middle. And let's just go ahead and share that with you all. This is what he had shared. And the Lord, you know, put it on his heart to make this. And I think this is absolutely excellent. The title says, Understand the difference between your enemies in general and those in the faith, quote, you know, in quotes, air quotes, in the faith, who betray and disregard Christ and the straight and narrow path he has set before us. So let's take a look at this. Let me just blow this up. And we're actually going to go line by line through some of these. And again, for some of you who have been with my channel for a while now, you'll know some of the videos in which I spoke about some of these. And this is incredibly important for the body of Christ, because if we look down the left hand side, most Christians know about the left hand side and they practice to the best of their ability, the left hand side. You know, we're supposed to pray. We're supposed to greet. Um, you know, there, in some cases, uh, judgment is, is not right, but you'll hear a lot of Christians say, judge not. And we're supposed to partake in terms of the gathering of the saints. We're supposed to go out and preach the gospel. We're supposed to fellowship. We're supposed to obey rulers. We're supposed to bless our enemies. Um, you know, all these things on the left-hand side generally are pretty commonplace in terms of knowledge and understanding within Christians. What people really don't have a knowledge of or understand is the other half, the right-hand side, a lot of which I have been teaching. The fact that there is a lot of scripture in the Bible which says there are situations, again, context is very important, there are situations where you are not to pray for people. There are situations where you don't greet people. There are definitely a lot of situations where you judge versus you judge not. There's a lot of situations of not partaking with people, coming out from certain people, not fellowshipping with certain people, not obeying rulers in some instances, some people being accursed. You know, this... You can see the stark contrast between the left and the right, and that's why this infographic really, really hit me so strongly. And so what we're going to do in this teaching is we're going to look mostly on the right-hand side here because the verses and the principles over on the left-hand side, most people are aware about. But these ones on the right-hand side, most people don't really know about it. And if they do know about it, they know they, they especially need to know how to use this within the proper context. So this is this is a disclaimer, right? The the left hand side is really about building up, and the right hand side is sort of like about breaking down or protecting certain things. And so the disclaimer is this: uh, there's a lot of people on the internet that love to you know judge a little bit too much. They tend to judge with some hypocrisy. There's a sense of pride, some, something similar to like what the Pharisees had exhibited. And they are very quick to call out everyone and anyone, and they are superior. 
That is not what the right hand side is about. Again, I've tried to really portray balance on this channel as much as possible. And so everything on the right hair has to be used with caution, with discernment, in prayer. Again, just be very balanced about it. This is not something to where we're, we're using these things, you know, just <laughs> off the cuff, nilly willy, just, you know, whenever we choose. Because I see a lot of that where you know, instead of reconciliation and forgiveness and repentance and things like that, um, someone, you know, cuts us off and then we're done with them. You're dead to me. Uh, that's not the Christian way. So that's that's a disclaimer as we go through this right hand side. So again, we're going to go through here generally line by line. This first one's really interesting because I had mentioned this in one of my prior videos about praying for your enemies. But in some cases, it says there's certain things you're you're not to pray for. That's really confounding. Um, let's take a look at some of the verses uh, that my friend and brother Eric had put in here. Matthew 5:44, pray for your enemies. Um, we know that verse, but specifically, let's look at the not to pray in Jeremiah 11. So this is one of the chapters that I had brought up in my. Um, video here, the two types of sin, one leads to death. Uh, the first one was, it says here in verse 14, Therefore do not pray for this people, or lift up a cry or prayer on their behalf, for I will not listen when they call to me in their time of trouble. Actually, if you look in Jeremiah 7, so that was Jeremiah 11, I believe. In Jeremiah 7, again, it's reiterated. As for you, do not pray for these people or lift up a cry or prayer for them and do not intercede with me for I will not hear you. Now, what's what's the context? You can read for yourself all throughout Jeremiah 7 through 11. Uh, this is basically the Lord's people that are continually unrepentant. They are continually going down a road of destruction through idols and sexual immorality and, and all sorts of things. And they will not listen to the word of the Lord given through the prophets or anything, really. They're just going along their own way. And as I've mentioned in other videos, there is a threshold that God has where he delivers you up unto your heart's desires. And these people's heart's desires were not for the Lord. It was for themselves and their idols. And so there is a point. The Lord has a threshold and he says, you know what? They've met it. Do not pray. Do not intercede with them. I'm going to deal with them myself. So two Old Testament verses, again, about not praying for a particular people when they've gotten so bad. You know, remind you, these are, these are God's people back then in the Old Testament. These were Jewish people that knew and understand um, the law and the Lord himself, the one true God, and they've abandoned him. Uh, the context today is Christians who know their Lord and Savior is Jesus Christ. So let's just look at a New Testament verse here. Uh, this is one of the ones I had brought up in my, my video, The Two Types of Sin, One Leads to Death. It says here in 1 John chapter 5, If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. Interesting. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. Again, in this video that I broke down all the scripture for you much more in detail, if there is a Christian, again, that bears the name of brother or sister in the Lord, and they are continually and willfully living a lifestyle of sin, that is unrepentant, and you or another has confronted them privately about this, and then when they don't repent with two to three witnesses and still no repentance, and even before a body of believers with a serious transgression, a serious sin, and there is no repentance for that, um, the Lord actually says, and, and I detail it uh, in this video and others, that that person is supposed to be cut off from the body of Christ. Again, it's a long progression. There's a lot of grace being extended to this person. But even before a large body of believers, they're refusing to repent. 
that is a serious transgression before the Lord. It does not mean that they're never going to be saved. There's many verses where Paul says he casts a person out to Satan for destruction of the flesh so that their spirit may be saved. They can always come back to repentance and come back to the body of Christ, and we are commanded to forgive them if they repent. If your brother comes to you you know, and sins against you 70 times 7 and repents, you are to forgive him. But if a person is unrepentant, that that's that's you know all the way up through a whole body of believers confronting them about it that is grounds for removing them from the body of christ and then they are at the lord's mercy really to do what he wants to do with them and i really do believe in my opinion that is what this verse is talking about that there is sin that leads to death and that sin, we know, is unrepentant sin, especially people that haven't come to Christ. Their sin has not been atoned for. It is unrepentant sin. So again, looking at this graphic, um, that's one of the first things that stood out for me because I had taught on it in the past. Now let's go to the next one here. Greeting versus not greeting. So in Matthew 5, 47, it talks about greeting your enemies. Let's see if I have that pulled up here. I do. Uh, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, this is Jesus speaking, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So we're, we're praying for our enemies of the world. Okay. So we are to pray. However, if we pull back up this infographic, we do greet our enemies, um, but we don't greet betrayers. So 2 John chapter 1. Let's go back here because this is about greeting and I was talking about praying. Um, last verse here, 47. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Also talks about how tax collectors, they even give good gifts to their children. You know, what is it to you if you only give good gifts to your children or only give good gifts to brothers or sisters? You know, you're supposed to go out into the world. And here it's saying, greet, greet other people of the world. You know, and extend the gospel to them. However, what's the other side of this coin? Don't greet. Second John chapter 1. Let's take a look at that. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. That is quite the strong wording here. And going back to this again, you'll see generally, uh, not... not uh, not categorically, okay, generally, the left-hand side really starts to apply to the world, okay? We're not to judge the world. I'm going to show you a verse about that. Paul says, who am I to judge the world? Is it not within the body of Christ that we are to judge? Greet people of the world. Pray for people of the world and also pray for people in the body of Christ. Um, we are not to judge the world. We're not really um, supposed to partake in the world, but the left-hand side really starts to deal generally you know, with the world, but on the right-hand side, it really starts to talk about people who are in serious transgression that are quote-unquote, that's what uh, Eric has up here in air quotes, in the faith. They're not really in the faith because they're under so much transgression. And then you start to get into some of these, these warnings. Do not pray, do not greet, judge, partake not. Let's go through a couple more of these here. Let's see, where did I leave off here? So we were in Second John 1, talking about not greeting them. Again, these are people that are deceivers. A lot of the false prophets and a lot of the false teachers and people that have a, um, you know, a very false gospel. This is not on matters of secondary doctrine, where we start to think about your view of the end times versus my view of the end times and eschatology. That's not what this is speaking about. This is about serious transgression against the word of God. You're not to greet these people. 
if you if you know about them. Next one. Judging not versus judging. I spoke about this in my video. If you haven't watched it, are Christians to judge one another? Look at this in much more detail than what we're going to look at it today, but a lot of scripture, which Paul, uh, in a very quick synopsis here, uh, summarizes for us saying, for what have I to do with judging outsiders, which is, which is people of the world? This is 1 Corinthians chapter 5. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? We are our brother and sister's keeper. God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Now, when Paul says purge the evil person from among you, is that, does that mean someone that's not a Christian? No, he's saying, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But I am writing to you, but I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. Again, someone who identifies as a Christian and calls himself a brother or sister. If they're guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or as an idolater, reveler, drunkard, or swindler, not to even eat with such a, such a one. So again, we have these, these strong warnings here about not to greet, not to partake, not to eat with someone that bears the name of brother and sister and is in serious, again, serious transgressions and are unrepentant when confronted about it. Purge them out. Again, you can look at that video for more information um, in terms of many more verses when we go into that. All right, uh, partaking and partaking not. Um, this, this is very similar to some of the other things we've spoken about here about greeting, fellowship. Some of these, you know, again, have a very common theme, um, but Eric has, has split them out just a little bit more. Let's see, do I have this one? Second John 11. We've actually just covered that. Um, again, just talking about partaking not of the wickedness within the body. Um, also, let me see, why did I have this pulled up here? Oh, here, again, um, speaking or referring back to what Paul has said here about, I wrote to you not to associate with sexually immoral people. Again, not the people of the world, but someone that bears the name of brother. And Jesus more or less says this as well in Matthew, let me see, what is this, Matthew 10. He says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as certain serpents as, and uh, be as innocent as doves. And so again, we, we are sent out as lambs into the world, into the midst of wolves. And our job, our duty, our servitude is to spread the gospel. So we are going to be around sexually immoral people, idolaters, all these things. And instead of judging them, which we're not supposed to do. We're not supposed to pinpoint their individual sins. The gospel is, it doesn't matter if you have one sin or if you have a billion sins, um, you are all sentenced to death, spiritual death. So everyone needs a savior. Everyone is essentially on equal playing field. They just need the gospel. You're not to judge them. However, once someone comes into the fold, once someone believes in the gospel and they come into the fold of the body of Christ, you come into the judgment of the saints. And again, when you look at this video, are Christians to judge one another? Um, judgment is a very, uh, it's a very important task that can't be taken lightly. Um, because with the judgment that you pronounce on a brother or sister, that judgment will likewise be applied to you. And if you are found in like transgression, you are a hypocrite and you will be chastised for that exact same thing. Um, so again, it's if you are to use that right of, of judging another brother or sister, just know that you have to be coming from a place of righteousness and not of a place of hypocrisy. Um, so again, more, more uh, on that topic in this video, Christians Judge One Another. Let's see what else I've got here. 
or rather what, what Eric has got here from what he was compelled to do in, in the name of the Lord. Um, again, go out to preach the gospel. I just said that. We're, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Um, but coming out from this prostitute of Babylon, which is in Revelation, come out from her, my people. Don't partake in her wickedness. So again, we are to go out as sheep among wolves. We're supposed to go out into the wickedness, but not to partake of it ourselves. Because once those sins and once those abominations start infiltrating the church body, it is like leaven. And again, it has to be judged within the body of Christ because that leaven will spread. Uh, let's see here. Fellowship, again, you know, very common themes here. Uh, we are supposed to have fellowship and walk in light. But again, there is a point where you do break fellowship. Uh, there's, a, there's a progression. I'm not going to go through it again, but it's in, I believe, Matthew 18. But there is a progression when someone is to be cast out. Um, one of the videos, I don't have it pulled up right now, but I might as well just go ahead and do so, is uh, the Sermon on the Mount. If we, if we look that up, anyone who hasn't had a chance to see this, this video, uh, the hidden manna of the Sermon on the Mount, I've mentioned this a couple times uh, on my channel, when Jesus is talking about if your eye causes you to sin, your hand causes you to sin, what not, um, you know, cut it off. Um, most Bible interpretations were, will say that Jesus was using hyperbole, that he's just exaggerating. Uh, but if you look at the hidden meaning of the body, which is given to us by Paul in Corinthians, he says that we are all different members of the same body of Christ. And he talks about the different utility or purposes of different body parts, like what shall the nose say to the mouth? You know, I have no use for you. No, we all have different parts. But Paul compares the different people that comprise the body of Christ as being a nose, a hand, a foot, a mouth. And so the hidden meaning in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus says to cut off your hand or whatnot, it is actually talking about someone that bears the name of brother or sister that is part of the body of Christ, that after much grace and, and much, you know, asking for repentance. They refuse to repent even before a body of believers. They are to be cast out of the body of Christ and delivered unto the Lord to do what he wishes to them. Again, it does not mean it's a sentence um, to eternal damnation, but <laughs> you know, as Paul cast people out of the body of Christ and delivered them to Satan for destruction of the, of the flesh, it's not a good place to be. Um, you would much rather uh, be judged by the saints, then fall into the hands of the living God. Put it that way. Um, but again, if you haven't seen that expounded upon, the hidden manna of the Sermon on the Mount is that video where I discuss or teach that. Another interesting one, considering the times that we're in, right? Do, do we obey rulers, uh, you know, when they're saying that you need to isolate in your homes versus church gatherings? Um Personally, the, the churches that we are seeing defy this order and congregate. It's, it's of a particular, well, again, I don't want to paint too broad of a, of a brush in case, uh, you know, there's some people that are watching uh, and I don't want to offend anyone by this. But for the ones that have made the media, we'll say that, uh, for the churches that have made the media, um, again, Rodney Howard Brown, um, he's, he's definitely a heretic. He's had a false gospel and he's you know, trying to, put his people uh, into the churches and, uh, you know, very, very similar styles of churches that are openly defying the order and getting the public attention um, versus, you know, a lot of other churches are still doing sermons online or they're doing a lot of these parking lot uh, sermons where everyone's just driving in the parking lot and they're getting the word sewed into them via that way. <clears throat> um Again, there's, we're just in an interesting spot of when do you or do you not obey rulers? Well, in Titus, uh, he has a verse here, uh, in Titus chapter 3, where you obey leaders and do good. Um, but there are a couple situations where you don't obey leaders, and I think it comes into practice where they, they ask you to defy your faith. And this is actually going to uh, dovetail into the mark of the beast. 
Uh, there's a lot of a lot of people talking about the mark of the beast. Um, maybe this weekend or Monday, I'll, I'll tell you my thoughts on that. But um, you know, when do you not obey a ruler? Well, let's let's just look at a couple examples here. Um, for, for one, here here's a good one: Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego um, openly defied uh, the ruler because they were being told to do something strictly against their faith. Compare that to today in the in the current crisis. Um, no one's saying, you know, not to practice your faith. We're still we're still meeting a lot of it online. A lot of us that was our fellowship, anyways, was through online means. Um, but no one's specifically asking us to worship a different god or to not worship at all. In a lot of cases, a lot of the states are saying that you're free to meet and congregate, but we would rather you not for the safety of your own people. Slippery slope, I know. Uh, I've seen a lot of videos with people getting tickets, even within the parking lots. <laughs> there's there's some poli police that are actually arresting people and, and giving them parking citations or whatnot because they're going onto church property, which is private property, going onto church property and just listening to a sermon, and the police are cracking down on that. So again, this is, this is a slippery slope where uh, this might dovetail into something bad. But again, for, an, for right now, I do believe that we're just to obey our rulers in the current time. But there may be a time where we, we say no, that you're infringing on our faith. Uh, another one, I think this is where uh, one that Eric had set here, a verse. Uh, and when they had brought them, this is, uh, let's see here, Acts 5. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name of Jesus, Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. So again, the same thing with um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as well as with the apostles. The government's world leaders, or even the priestly leaders, were saying, Stop practicing your faith. And you can see a very clear... Uh, line in the sand where you're you're not to obey men in, in those circumstances. Uh, let's see, what else do I have here? Because we're, we're wrapping up. I got uh, Romans 16 here. Now let's see if uh, Eric had that in here. I don't believe, I don't believe he did, but let's just look at in the last couple ones here. Um, blessing your enemies. Again, that goes back to Matthew chapter 5 that we looked at. Um, and then let them be accursed. That's in Galatians. So, right, this is, again, people that preach a different gospel than the one that you have heard. Spoken about this a lot of times, and especially in the last video, where some people will use that verse out of context where it says, hey, as long as Christ is being proclaimed, in that I rejoice. That's what Paul had said. But, again, that's if people are preaching the right and true word of God and the right gospel be a little bit redundant in case anyone um, missed that last message. But the first test is, is a preacher or a teacher or anyone really, are they preaching the true word of God and the true gospel? Yes or no? If no, if they're teaching a different gospel and they claim to be a brother or sister, they're accursed. You're, have, you're to have nothing to do with them. Okay, but if they are preaching the true word and the true gospel, um. You know, what motivations do they have for that? There are some people whose motivations are rivalry or greed. And so it's very vain. And that's the people that Paul was talking about. They were trying to be a better apostle than him, or they were trying to be, you know, a better person than him because he was in prison and they were trying to make a name for themselves. Um, he said, you know what? Um, they're doing it for their own self-gain and vanity, but they're still preaching the right thing. So in that, at least I rejoice because, again, people are being fed the right knowledge. But for anyone that preaches a different gospel or preaches outside of the word of God, you know, let them let them be a curse, especially if it's if it's another gospel. Um, let peace come upon versus peace return. Uh, this is in Matthew 10. Let's see here. Do I have it here? <clears throat> Let me get that reference again here. Matthew 10, 13. This is about uh, removing the dust from your feet. 
Um, is this the right one here? No, that's Matthew 5. My apologies. Matthew 10, 13. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not listen to or if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Uh, this relates to the words that Paul was given where he talks about not casting your pearls before swine. If you come into a house or you try to preach the gospel to someone and you come in a manner of peace and they receive you, then by all means continue on with them and tr try to minister to them. And if they receive Christ, disciple them. Um, but if they have, want nothing to do with you, nothing to do with you at all, and, and they just sort of cast you out, let the peace return to you and just shake off the dust from your feet and then move on to the next one. If, if This is the difficult thing, but if someone just continually doesn't want to hear anything you have to say, um, you'll have to you know, ask God in prayer whether you're still to work on that person or not, or if you are just supposed to shake the dust off your feet and if it is, in fact, casting pearls at swine. Again, don't want to be too dogmatic about that in every individual circumstance. It really has to be something thoughtful that's done in prayer to God, in counsel with God. Again, guys, I do not want to make broad sweeping strokes here that if if anyone um, if anyone you know rejects you immediately, that they're never going to accept Christ again. That's not true. We know a lot of people that are very hard in their heart to the gospel, um, but then something happens where they soften up a little and then they listen later on. So again, you just have to be, um, you know, very careful with being too too dogmatic about some of these things. Uh, you really have to use discernment. And then lastly, um, he has forsake not the gathering versus mark and avoid, which again is a very common theme throughout this right-hand side about not having fellowship people being accursed, partaking not, not greeting, not praying, marking and avoiding. Again, it's for those that are supposedly, or they say they're a Christian or bear the name of brother or sister, but they're they're very much um, brothers, or, or I wouldn't even use that term. Um, Paul says that they've snuck in unawares. I think he says brothers snuck in unawares, false brothers. False brethren stuck in unawares. So I have a couple more tabs here, and I, I sort of forget why I had them here, but uh, we'll, we'll look through what I have highlighted. Um, okay, just, just a couple more examples about avoiding people that are bearing the name of brother or sister. This is in uh, Romans 16, and you can, you can look all throughout the New Testament. This isn't the only amount of scripture which points to this. Um, you can, you can find so much more. But uh, Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught and avoid them. So again, mark and avoid them. Another one in Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Uh, this, is, this is more of a softer rebuke, but I just want to pull it up anyways. Um, because this, this inherently doesn't sound Christian. It really doesn't. Um, if you think very generically about the Christian faith, um, you know it, it's all about grace and it's forgiveness and everything like that. And so this sounds very unchristian-like if you read it. But let's just go ahead and, and read through some of the words here. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now, such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. So again, there, there are different levels Right, so Paul in another letter talks about sexual immorality, really bad sexual immorality. He's saying flat out, cut that person out of the church. Here, this is someone that's sort of um, siphoning things away from other people. You know, they're they're really not working. They're just sitting in idleness, 
and more than likely they're, they're asking other people to provide for their means. So it is a transgression that Paul is calling out here. And he is saying that you are to mark that person and have nothing to do with him so that he may be ashamed. Again, it, does, it really does not sound Christian-like in a general sense. But it is supposed to provide repentance. The person is supposed to be ashamed because they're not earning their own living, um, even though they're capable. They're not earning their own living. They're, they're capable of doing it, but they're siphoning off from other people, and they're using. It's really using and abusing other people. So don't regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Again, reproval, rebuke, following Matthew 18, being very gracious about it in private, then two to three witnesses, then before a body of believers. Um, but again, I just wanted to highlight that there's a, there's a lot of this, this marking and avoiding um, that's given to us in the Bible. Again, with discretion, not painting too wide a brushstrokes here, with discernment and discretion. And so that's the, the last of the tabs that I have here. But I guess I'll conclude this just, just with how I sort of started here. Uh, this this infographic. Let me just pull it up one more time here. You know, this infographic is just a, a very good reminder of two different. You know, I don't want to simplify it too much, but two different aspects of Christianity. Um, and as we go through each of these, you know, we we need to make sure that we have discernment and we have discretion and that we're in prayer regarding our attitudes or our actions with each one of these. Because I don't want people to, to really take this too far because we see that. We see people mark and avoid everyone. We see ministries out there that start to go after everyone, literally everyone, um, not reaching out to people privately, uh, even if they did. And it, it's just like saying that this person's apostate, that person's apostate, and it's really breaking down. It's creating hostility. It's creating quarrels. It's creating unnecessary division. Um, we we don't aim for that. We aim for building things up. You know, Paul says that I aim for building up the church, but the Lord Jesus Christ has given me power, um, basically, to chastise, um, uh, to judge, and to chastise if he needs to, if it comes to that. So we, we don't want to come to that point. Um, we all want to walk in holiness. And if we fail, we pick up our cross and we go again. And we repent before our Lord Jesus Christ. And if there are certain afflictions that are routine and we're having a hard time breaking from them, um, I believe in the first and second epistles of John, it says, you know, confess your sins to one another um, because people can pray for you and lay hands on you. And the prayer of a righteous person is working. Um, so we don't want to get to that point. We really don't want to get to that point where, you know, harsh judgment by the saints within the body of Christ is utilized. But we need to understand that it's a necessary thing sometimes. And especially the reason why I brought this topic up today is because more and more and more we're seeing false teachers and false prophets capitalize on the situation and lead people astray with false doctrines. Left and right, it's happening. It's happening very quickly right now. And so very gracefully, uh, if you see someone starting to fall outside of the word of God and even uh, chase after a potential false gospel, uh, you are to intervene. And if in, in your intervention, they don't want to hear you, and you even bring it before, again, close brothers or sisters. You don't just bring in some stranger. People that are within your fellowship and, and they don't want to have anything to do with you and don't want to repent or anything like that. Um, you know, at some point you're going to have to you're going to have to cut ties. If they repent, then you bring them back in. You're commanded to if they repent. But as the Bible says, and I'll pull this up as well, uh, the Bible says that here it is let me share this with you first corinthians chapter 15 do not be deceived bad company ruins good morals 
Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Again, again, Paul is actually, you know, shame is actually a powerful thing. Um, you know, there's a lot of times where I've felt shamed in something that I've, I was doing, and it brought me to repentance. It made me change my ways. There's a positive outcome in it. But again, don't be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. And I, I see this, and you got to be so careful about it. Looking at that infographic and, and seeing that at, in certain circumstances, when someone is absolutely woefully unrepentant, has a false gospel, there cannot be fellowship with those people. Cannot. Absolutely cannot. And if in ignorance you say, well, you know, they're still preaching Christ. It's a false Christ. They're still preaching Christ. You know, Paul rejoiced when someone was preaching Christ. I want to have grace just like the Lord had grace. If you fellowship with that false, again, if you fellowship with people that are um, giving out a false gospel or in serious transgression of some other aspect of the word of God, that's bad company. And you hang around that long enough and it will ruin your own good morals. Uh, again, I've seen this many times, even in my own walk. There was a point in time, again, when I did that video, The Two Types of Sin, One Leads to Death, and I talked about the importance of repentance in terms of salvation. I had a whole ton of people, a whole ton of people before that video. That's I did that video to address a lot of folks. But before that, I had a whole lot of people saying that I had a false gospel because I was preaching repentance ongoing. Now, repentance ongoing is an added work to the finished work of the cross, which is just confounding um, That to think that you would only need to repent once. Um, no, re repentance is, is something that's instilled in the life of a believer. Uh, if, again, if you read through the first and second epistles of John and, and what I cover in that video, repentance um, is just an inherent part of the Christian walk. But when more and more people were surrounding me saying that repentance is a work and it's, you know, to say that people need to repent, you know, after their baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's, oh, you're, you're preaching a false gospel. Um, it actually started to get in my head. One of the things that got in my head was, okay, well, Paul, um, did he repent before the Lord Jesus Christ approached him? No, he didn't. He repented afterwards, but did he, did he repent before? I guess he didn't really have to. All these things started swirling in my head and started messing me up. Um, so I had to retract. I had to back out of the online world and the online communities and go back to Scripture, go back to the Word of God, and, and see for myself what it says on this matter. Um, but again, bad company ruins good morals. If you're hanging out with bad company that is intertwining with false gospels or, or, or serious transgressions of the word of God, that will start to twist this in your head. And so that is why um, the word of God tells us that in, in a lot of circumstances, again, with utmost discretion and discernment in prayer, uh, that you are to separate some, from some people. So again, uh, I'll just flash this up on the screen, you know, one more time uh, for anyone that hasn't seen it. Uh, Eric is the one who created this. His Facebook profile is in the YouTube description box. If you want to follow him, he posts uh, very similar things like this. He, he likes to do these infographics, communicate a, a little bit of or a lot of information in a very short and easy under, uh, to understand manner. Uh, you can go ahead and you know follow his page. Uh, but I was very blessed by this. I do believe that this is definitely the work of the Lord um, that he was brought to do. And uh, I saw a lot of the same things that I've been teaching in here, and I thought you all would be blessed by it as well. So, again, hope you all have a blessed Resurrection Day, today or tomorrow, whichever one you celebrate, and that you stay safe. And I will see you all tomorrow in a live stream, again with Tony. That will be at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we are going to be talking about a lot. It might might be more than an hour. Uh, we'll, we'll just go into a lot of the confusion 
I think that's happening with the current situation regarding the numbers, regarding the actions of governments, and, and so on and so forth. It'll be really interesting because this will be the first uh, the first chat that I'll have with another brother on the show since this whole crisis sort of happened. So until then, God bless you all. Uh, keep the faith. This is Mike with On Point Preparedness. God bless everybody.